Hi everyone, welcome. If you were looking for our Sea Otter Awareness Week program, our Sea Otter program here with the Marine Mammal Center, you are in the right place for second chances for sea otters. Thank you all so, so much for tuning in today. Um, and again, you're in the right place if you're looking for second chances for sea otters in conjunction with Sea Otter Savvy as we work with Sea Otter Awareness Week 2023. Definitely my favorite week of the year. Do also want to mention if you're starting to see a slight lag between uh, my video and my audio, I apologize. I've been struggling with it for a little bit, so no need to worry. We'll catch up as we go along together. But you are indeed in the right place if you are looking for second chances for sea otters here with the Marine Mammal Center joined by our friends at Sea Otter Savvy as we work together on some programming for Sea Otter Awareness Week. So welcome everyone. Go ahead and put in the comments if you'd like, sort of if you've been to one of these live programs before, where you're tuning in from. We always love getting to see where our folks are coming and tuning in from. So feel free to put that right in those chat. Welcome, welcome folks. We'll get started here in just a moment. I hope you're all excited for some sea otter stuff. I know it is definitely my very favorite. They are a personal favorite of mine. Um, so I hope that you all get to love these sea otters as much as I do as we explore second chances for sea otters together today. And welcome, welcome. I'm starting to see some folks tuning in. So welcome, Petra. I'm so glad that you love the sea otter art on the screen. It's actually thanks to our friends at Sea Otter Savvy. Um, and I see that you're tuning in from Santa Cruz and Monterey Bay. Yay, MBO. <laughs> Hi, Jacqueline from Illinois. Thank you so much for tuning in with us today. And Mary from Fort Bragg. I'm so excited that you were able to make it today. Thank you so much for tuning in for Second Chances for sea otters as we explore a little bit more our work here at the center when it comes to sea otters in particular and how amazing they are. I want to give a little welcome to Julie that I'm seeing right from San Francisco in our very own backyard here. So thank you again for tuning in and thank you for tuning in Suzanne and Moran. Again, another backyard neighbor. So exciting to see so many folks tuning in. You're in the right spot if you are looking for second chances for sea otters today, which I hope you all are since it is Sea Otter Awareness Week. And hello to Andrea, who is a big sea otter fan all the way in New York City. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm really excited that we're getting to extend our reach all across the country and beyond. So thank you so much for doing so. Hope you're all ready for some very cute photos. <laughs> And hello from Roger turning, tuning in as well, excuse me, and Margaret from Glendale. So excited to see you here. Now we'll go ahead and get us starting to get kicked off, uh, start off here and get started. Excuse me, I'm tripping on my words already. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to our friends here. Um, we've got Heather Barrett joining us today from Sea Otter Savvy, who's really hosting this big Sea Otter Awareness Week all of the programs that we have going on. So really excited to invite you. Thank you so much for uh, coming with us today, Heather. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hey, thank you so much, Crystal. Hi, everyone. My name is Heather Barrett and I'm a sea otter biologist and I'm the science communication director for Sea Otter Savvy. And we are so thrilled to be able to work together with the Marine Mammal Center for this particular program. I wanted to give you guys all a little bit of background about Sea Otter Awareness Week. It occurs every year during the last full week of September this year. It's from September 24th. So yesterday was the first day, today's the second day, and it will go all the way until this Saturday, the 30th. Um, and it is organized actually in partnership by us, but also Defenders of Wildlife, California State Parks, Alaka Alliance, and Monterey Bay Aquarium. And we thank all of the collaborators like the Marine Mammal Center that join us in helping to spread awareness this week through all these different in-person and live streamed events. So this year marks the 21st year, and the theme is Restoring Missing Links. And we're recognizing that sea otters remain absent from large portions of their historical range, while we're also celebrating the active efforts of conservation groups um, like the Marine Mammal Center to restore continued population of these charismatic creatures and other missing elements along the Pacific coast. 
I also want to recognize that sea otters have influenced the livelihoods, culture, and spiritual aspects of coastal communities throughout human history. And many of these communities have their own words for sea otter. So including the words that you see in the inner ring of this year's logo. When I designed this logo this year, I really wanted to make sure that we were able to celebrate all these different cultures. And these are just highlighting some of them. There are many, many more. So to learn more and see all of this year's events, you can visit the official calendar of events on the Defenders website, which will hopefully get put access to you after as well. Now, this week also highlights Sea Otter Savvy's We Were Here Sea Otter program. I'm wearing the shirt. And we educate communities and stakeholders who are missing sea otters and offers a survey for community involvement. So the Southern Sea Otter Range is currently from Gaviota State Park in the south to around Año Nuevo State Park in the north. And sea otters did once inhabit all along the Pacific coast. They are ecologically as well as culturally significant. And there is increasing discussion regarding possible reintroduction to historical habitats. So to move forward, government agencies, sea otter research community, we need to engage communities and stakeholders to hear your perspectives. So if you're wondering what you can do today, please take the sea otter survey if you haven't already and share your thoughts on possible reintroduction. We wanna hear your concerns, your support, your ideas, your questions, your voices, matter. Now the links and the website and the survey will all be made available to you at the end and they're also going to be posted with this video. So with that I'm going to pass it back to Crystal and thank you guys all for joining us for Sea Otter Awareness Week and I hope to see you guys at more events. Bye. Thank you so so much Heather for getting us kicked off on this program. I'm so excited to be here with you all to talk about possibly the cutest but definitely the smallest of all marine mammals, the sea otter. Now of course today we're also going to leave some time at the end of the program for questions. So as you're here with us, feel free to put up any questions um, or thoughts in the chat and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can today. But we're in for a special treat because I'm joined today by our medical director, Dr. Cara Field, and also our chief external relations officer, Dr. Jeff Boehm as well. Now, there's lots that we're going to dive into, but before we dive totally into our work when it comes to giving second chances to sea otters, I'm sure everyone would love to know what your thoughts are on sea otters since you've both had the opportunity to work with them. I'll jump in, uh, Cara. I don't know if you'll agree, and, and and thank you, Crystal. Delighted to be be with you in this conversation today. Um, the words mischief and mayhem come to mind, and I say that lovingly. But they they are there's something there's like a um, a correlation. The the cuter the animal is, the more trouble they tend to get into. What do you think, Cara? Jeff, I 100% agree with that. <laughs> As uh, one of the many people here at the Marine Mammal Center and other places who are responsible for their care, um, you really see that sort of, uh, that um, not to use this in a negative term, but that weasel nature. Um, they're <laughs> smart. Um, they can get bored quite easily and they're very good at problem solving. So just when you think you've otterproofed everything, they'll surprise you with, uh, with a new twist. Or new take on things and um they definitely are an animal that keeps you on your toes yeah I, I worked um with otters at a facility where they would take the nuts off of bolts with their little midi paws right um yes. that had been put on with power tools right um amazing amazing strength dexterity yeah yes Thank i've you. also been fortunate like you jeff to work with them in a an aquarium setting where otters that were abandoned or um, orphaned as pups ended up so that they could live out their lives. And uh, one of the things to, to that they teach them is they have to do sort of like train them to do sort of a stick them up because they'll hide stuff in these little kind of skin boxes <laughs> and swim off of it. And they're very good at pretending there's nothing there. So, I mean, they really are clever and um, of course endearing with that little face. How could you not love that face? Yeah. So they're highly forgivable. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and as members of the weasel family, which you alluded to, it's not surprising that these little animals pack such a big personality. And as the largest marine mammal hospital in the world, we've been working to rescue and rehabilitate marine mammals for almost 50 years and have had now about 25 years dedicated to specific sea otters work as well. 
Now, in fact, we've had to retrofit some of our pens. I know you mentioned them uh, unscrewing some power tool put on materials as well. Um, so Cara, do you mind sharing with us a little bit what we've had to do uh, to accommodate for these little Houdinis? <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, so in addition to being excellent swimmers and divers, they're also quite good climbers. They're they're probably one of the most recently adapted marine mammals. And so you can see in that photo, we have quite a tall wall there, um, both a concrete wall at the base of it. Um, and we had to retrofit the inside of the pens to otterproof them because they can stand up on those hind legs and reach up to that mesh wire and they could climb potentially all the way over it if they're feeling really good. So we had to put some smooth paneling on the inside of it. Um, and a really tall door with a little viewing window um, that we could both see through so that we could see where they are when we're entering the pen and making sure they're not sitting there at the door waiting for us to <laughs> open it and have them run past us. Um, and of course we had to make the, that smooth area tall enough so that if they stand up, um, they couldn't climb up onto the ledge and, and further up and out. So uh, they're that escape artist, um, they're very good at that like some other animals and of course, we want to keep them contained. Um, fortunately, they do like to stay near water and in their pools. So most of the time, they're pretty good about staying in the water when we come in. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for going through some of that setup that we've had to come up with. Now, we know that giving sea otters a second chance of life at the wild through rescue and rehab is a core part of what we do here at the center, work that is possible because of the support from viewers just like in our audience today. So thank you. Thank you so much. And Cara, I'm curious, can you walk us through a little bit about what happens when an otter is first brought to the hospital? Absolutely. So these pictures are, of course, of otters that are look like they're pretty happy. Um, but unfortunately, sea otters, when they first strand, usually, or wash ashore, by the time they that actually happens and we can get to them and get our nets on them, they're in really, really severely debilitated condition, if not near dead. And sometimes they die before we can actually get them even to the hospital. Um, so they're literally fighting at that point. They're fighting for their life with their last breath when we come up, as you can see in this photo with a net. Um, and um, by then, they're unlike other marine mammals, they, they rely on their very dense fur to be able to live and survive in the cold ocean. So if that fur gets compromised, they don't have any blubber. They're going to run out of energy really, really, really fast. So um, on admission, we're also we're always very aware that, you know, their blood sugar might be really low, um, and yet they might, with their last gasp, try to sink their teeth into us. So it's a combination of being very cautious, um, and usually we'll go ahead and anesthetize them um, under general anesthesia, even when they're compromised, um, for our safety and so that we can really get a good evaluation of what's going on. Um, because many of them suffer from shark bite wounds that might be uh, look kind of small, but are actually really deep. So in addition to being able to find those, we also need to assess how deep those are and um, and whether or not that's something that we can fix and whether or not there's broken ribs uh, or anything else like that. So that usually means taking um, taking radiographs or x-rays, um, getting blood samples and everything else that we can do to try to figure out right away on that time of admission what's wrong with them. Well, thank you so much for taking such great care of every otter that making its way into our hospital. Now, one thing I always find really fun with otters in particular is that in addition to all of this extra care that we take with them, they're also incredibly picky eaters. Um, so a little bit pickier than most of our marine mammal patients. They prefer foods like scallops, clams, other crustaceans, um, which is a little different than our typical sustainable herring meals. Their expensive tastes, in fact, can be about $41 a day for an otter. So how long is a typical stay here for an otter at the center? Yeah, those... Um... Oh, I'm sorry, Cara, go ahead. No, go ahead, Jeff. Um, th those uh, uh, costs uh, really do pile up, and especially with an otter um, that we might have in care for, for months, or if it's a, um, a sub-adult or juvenile animal, um, even up, up to a year. And, and just a reminder, as a nonprofit organization, our, our work is fueled by the likes of folks on this call. And it's, it's with a lot of appreciation that we tell these stories. But yeah, picky and pricey little eaters. 
Thank you so much for that. And I actually just saw a really great question from the audience that I'd love to get to work in. Um, the question came in, where is the biggest population of sea otters in California? Ooh, who's going to, who's going to feel that one? <laughs> yeah, I would, I would just say, um, uh, point your uh, maps towards uh, the Monterey Bay and you're going to see a really large concentration right there, knowing folks are from all over the country on this uh, webinar, um, right there in um, Central California. There you go. Um, Monterey Bay Operations, as it's pictured there, that's the name of our triage facility um, in Moss Landing, California. It's from there that we do a lot of work in both Santa Cruz County and Monterey County and have great partners like the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Thank you so, so much for that. And a great reminder for folks too, as you're coming up with questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll have tons of time also at the end in case we don't get to them in this moment. Um, but I'd love to know, um, kind of coming back to the hospital, hospital a little bit, what sorts of things do otters typically come in to get treated for? So the, the main things that we see in our uh, sea otters that wash ashore are uh, trauma, um, very often from shark bite. And unfortunately, that's probably at this point the leading cause of why we are not seeing our southern sea otters expand either north or south. Um, so we, we work to protect our great white sharks and they've made a great comeback. And unfortunately, um, Great whites are actually trying to eat seals and sea lions, so and uh, uh, not really otters, because otters are mostly kind of like a f ball of fur, whereas a seal and a sea lion is a nice ball of blubber. And so a shark, they want the blubber, so they do what we we often term test bites. They'll bite an otter that might be sleeping in the kelp, um, mistaking it maybe for a young sea lion. Um, the otter, of course, tries to fight back, but a test bite, even from a great white shark, uh, incredibly large and powerful animal can be devastating for a, a, one of these otters that might only weigh 50, up to 50 or 60 pounds. So unfortunately, the, the trauma associated with those bite wounds um, can be really debilitating for them. But we also see a variety of other diseases. Um, one of the most uh, other common things that we see are protozoal parasite infections. And these are little single cell parasites. Some of you might be familiar with one called toxoplasma. And it's uh, toxoplasma is a parasite that's pooped out by kitty cats and it actually survives in the environment a really long time. It enters the ocean through runoff and it concentrates in like in the food that these little otters eat. So like uh, clams and mussels and it can accumulate in crab and other animals. So when the otter eats uh, this food, then it acquires the parasite. And unfortunately that parasite can cause a really nasty encephalitis or inflammation of the brain that causes tremors and seizures and ultimately death. Um, so that's another big risk, another big health problem with these guys. Um, and another big category that we worry about is a biotoxin called demoic acid. And that's produced during certain harmful algal blooms. And it affects not just otters, but we humans and many other marine life as well, many other marine mammals. And in these guys, same, similar to that parasite, uh, this biotoxin accumulates in the food that they eat. And then they ingest it and it can cause similar seizures as well as cardiac disease. So it actually causes what we call a cardiomyopathy or abnormal pathology of the heart. Um, and that prevents them from being able to really dive and forage because that heart, heart disease um, limits how uh, their ability to exercise and to have normal heart function. So those are just some of the three top types of diseases that we see. And of course, there's many other things like um, human is, uh, activity associated trauma, like fish hooks and getting stuck in gill nets or fishing nets or monofilament um, and a number of other things. But those are definitely problematic for our little otters. Well, again, thank you so much for doing everything you can to make sure that every one of these otters coming in through our doors is set up for success and that we're preparing them for life back out in the wild again. Um, and I'd love to actually ask you a little bit more, what sorts of things are you and your team doing in order to make sure that they have their best chance for their second chance in the wild? Anything in particular that they need to learn before? So when most of the otters that we care for here at the Marine Mammal Center are um, old enough to be dependent um, on their own or independent, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, not dependent, dependent on us, I guess. Um, so otter pups really do best when they're raised by a mom. And so we're so fortunate that our partners at Monterey Aquarium and expanding with some other partnerships are able to 
house uh, surrogate sea otters, otters that have stranded and are not be able to be released back into the wild. And these otter moms do a much better job at raising those little pups than we do. So here at the Marine Mammal Center, we accept patient, we, our patient so are mostly a little bit older and independent, but they still come in in really, really bad shape and critical shape. So it requires a lot of intensive care. They need to eat constantly. Um, they don't always like the delicious sea lion, uh, sea lion seafood smorgasbord that we have to offer. They're often like, nope, I will not eat that delicious restaurant quality clam um, or mussel or whatever. So really a huge component is getting them to eat because um, they absolutely have to have those calories. Um, another part is getting them medication because they're very particular eaters, as I mentioned, and they often can taste uh, medication. So um, given that they're already a little fussy about food, you add some medication in there, like some antibiotics or some pain medication, and even more so, they're like, no. So uh, um, sometimes we have to handle them to administer the treatments and fluids and sometimes we do have to sort of wrestle with them a little bit to get the food on board if they're not eating on their own. We also, and when they're in really rough shape, they can't even groom themselves properly. So we have to wash and dry them. Um, so we call it a spa day or sometimes it's a hourly spa. Um, so it really does require a lot of intensive care for these animals, especially when they first come in. And um, we're so fortunate that we have an incredible team that is able to prepare their food um, and make sure that they're cared for, wash them, clean them, dry them, fluff them, um, offer them food again, and re rinse, recycle, um, rinse, repeat, and recycle. So it's a, it's a lot of intensive work for this incredible otter, and they're worth it. They're incredibly important species for our ecosystem. So all of us are very happy to try to get them back into a good state of health. Thank you so much. And we actually got in another great question from the audience. Mike asked about releasing these sea otters and was curious how we determine a safe release site for something like a sea otter. Sure. So for the sea otters, we actually, they have a lot of site fidelity as they're growing up, which means they usually forage and live in the same general area. So um, we, uh, in agreement with Fish and Wildlife, agree that's really important to try to put them back where they came from because that's the area that they know that's where they've been successfully foraging on their own um, that being said some of the younger otters that may not have established a home range those animals might be appropriate candidates to move to release into a different area and that's one of the strategies that our partners have taken in rebuilding populations of otters that have been depleted so elkhorn slough is a wonderful example of that where surrogate sea otter pups that were either orphaned or um, found themselves on their own so they didn't really have a home range so once they released back into the wild a very safe and uh, food rich place for them was elkhorn slough and that has resulted in the successful highly successful repopulation of that area and those otters do very well there um, so it really depends on their circumstances but we work very hard to introduce them back into an otter-friendly habitat. That's fantastic. And I know that everybody is putting in so much work to make sure that these animals are ready for life out in the open ocean again. So I've got to ask, what's it like being at those releases and getting to see them get out after working so hard on their rehabilitation? I got to tell you, um, whether it's a sea otter or a sea lion or a fur seal, um, these releases, like you're seeing this video now, are are some of the most moving experiences, and in, in, in such a delightful moment, um, you have all of the hours and days and weeks and commitments of of tens, hundreds of individuals, kind of summed up and embodied in in this guy. <laughs> crawl walk -ing across the beach but just beautiful moving every time exactly jeff i i couldn't have said it better it's it's an incredible sense of fulfillment when you see them return back to their ocean home happy and healthy maybe a little awkwardly with the walking that's just an otter thing they, <laughs> yeah right those hind legs evolved to be able to swim <laughs> better than walk um so they do look a little funny and awkward but um but ultimately very successful at uh, being able to swim back home 
Oh, thank you so, so much for all of this. And we have another great question coming in from the audience. So Jeff, I think I'm going to pass this one to you. Sure. Um, and it's a little bit more about demoic acid, which Dr. Cara had mentioned earlier. And it's a question if have sea otters been affected by demoic acid like the sea lions have? Yeah, so um, great question, timely question. And listeners may be familiar from just general media of um, a harmful algal bloom, probably a phrase that's familiar to folks um, off the coast of uh, California, further south than us with its impact. So sea lions were, were getting hit hard by this toxin. It's a naturally occurring toxin uh, produced by algae that gets consumed by uh, other organisms and then fish, and then it gets concentrated. And when consumed by uh, classically in our region, uh, sea lions can cause just, just horrible impacts, um, seizures in the animals, um, uh, atrophy or death of neural tissue. Um, really, really nasty stuff. I'll, I'll remind you that it's a, um, uh, a mimic of a neurotransmitter in mammalian systems. So we humans are vulnerable to this as well. Making a long answer out of this, sorry, um, to the questioner, but we have not seen uh, that impact um, in any great way up in our region of California this year, nor with um, our otters, though we do see otters from time to time with demoic acid toxicosis. Thank you so much for that. I know that there's a lot going on that it really does take an entire village to think about our impact on marine mammals at large and also the care that it takes for them just here and to making sure that they're safely out in the wild. So I'm curious if you have any um, sort of tips. What can our audience members listening in right now do to help out sea otters? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Um, Boy, first of all, uh, don't leave a program like this thinking that you can't help sea otters because you can. If you're if you're fortunate to be on a coast like like we are and you see sea otters, see them from a distance. Keep yourself about 50 feet away wherever you are. Think about what your contribution is, either positively or negatively, to climate change and your carbon footprint. Um, a lot of the dynamic changes in the ocean that we're seeing are, are temperature uh, related. Support organizations like the Marine Mammal Center and other ocean conservation organizations, and you'll be making a difference. Uh, we have we have listeners I, I know from the Midwest. Um, you do not need to be on the coast to be an ocean champion. Um, everything each and every one of us does every day is either moving the needle in a positive way or a negative way around the environment. And we invite you to be partners with us on trying to do the right thing. Thank you so, so much. Now, we also know that they're needing a lot of help because of human impact. They, in the past, were really extensively hunted for their luxurious fur, yeah. which led to that dramatic decline in their population and really that need for protection. So they're listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Um, so why is it so important to protect this particular threatened species? Yeah, the um, another phrase folks will be familiar with, I think, is a keystone species. Um, these uh, these animals are not large in numbers, but their impact is huge. Uh, uh, Car earlier talked about Elkhorn Slough, a body of water not far from where we are here in California that has been completely transformed because of these animals. Their impact um, really has an ecosystem effect, and so what they prey upon, we've talked a lot about their eating in this conversation, but what they prey upon allows um, algae and kelp and other um, plants and uh, organisms to thrive. So where you see healthy sea otters, you see a healthy environment, you know, to bring images of those vast um, kelp forests to mind or um, um, eelgrass beds in, in more um, estuary environments. We call them little en environmental engineers because they really do, as a population, have an impact on, on the world they live in. And again, where you see healthy otters, you see healthy ecosystems. 
That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that yeah. wonderful reminder on their huge impact that they have on a healthy ecosystem. Now, the vast majority of our rescues happen down in San Luis Obispo, in Monterey, and in Santa Cruz counties, since that's where the species is most commonly found. Um, but that wasn't always the case, right? Yeah, do you want to take this one, Car, or you want me to? Oh, go ahead. You're on a roll. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so historically, if we could zoom out from this, this image, um, sea otters ranged all the way around kind of the rim of fire, right? Uh, all the way up um, uh, along the Aleutian Islands in, in Western uh, Alaska, through to Russia and even Japan. Um, hundreds of thousands of animals uh, hunted uh, to an extreme extent to the point that there were just vestiges of that population um, as we, as certainly as we moved into this century. Thank you. And with that, we actually have a great audience question. So Tristan hmm. had asked, how far north above Monterey have otters settled along our California coastline? So in California, it's um, Pigeon Point in San Mateo County is kind of the northern extreme of where they've settled. Um, but I'll tell you that here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we will see a random otter uh, now and then. And of course, there are healthier populations um, further north into Alaska and, and beyond as well. But in California, they're kind of uh, constrained there between um, Point Conception on the south and, and Pigeon Point on the north. Thank you so much. I know it is yeah. always really fun when we get the, the rogue otter that makes it all the way up into San Francisco Bay. Right. Um, but Dr. Carr, I have one for you next. So sure. we just talked about how they're a keystone species. Mm -hmm. So I imagine mm -hmm. that with this shift in their range, it has a much larger impact on the environment than maybe just simply a lack of otters. Exactly. So, so we mentioned, talked a little bit before about the impact that they have on the ecosystem and um, they really do modulate how the ecosystem works. So they, they do that by, um, keeping some of the different populations of uh, invertebrates uh, in check, like certain sea urchins, for example. And when those populations of those invertebrates are out of proportion, you can end up with a really unbalanced ecosystem. And um, especially when it comes to kelp, eelgrass, and um, other parts of the environment that, that create habitat for the entire ecosystem, not just uh, for the higher trophic levels like us and sea otters. Um, so they really are important as uh, modulators of every level in there. And so, um, you know, obviously none of us remember what our coast probably looked like back in the day when sea otters inhabited the entire coast, but they, they really have a powerful effect. And so there is currently ongoing discussions about reintroducing them into their original home range because it was due exclusively to human impacts that they were removed essentially. Um, and for, we're fortunate to still have some of the Southern Sea Otters now. Um, so um, we, among many other folks, have been talking about whether or not is this feasible. So this is a, you know, much higher than the Marine Mammal Center. This is obviously a huge um, in potential environmental shift and change, um, but it's one that, especially in a growing and changing climate, where the impacts of extreme weather are, are being felt more and more, having a healthy balanced ecosystem will benefit all of us, not just sea otters, but literally all of us. And so there's been a lot of discussion, of course, that is ecologically, we also, we humans have a lot of economic tie-ins to our environment um, and different fisheries like uh, different crab and clam and so forth. So one of the most important things is for us to really look holistically at all the factors, at the environment, at the otters, at ourselves, and see what will be both feasible and what's gonna be um, sort of acceptable. Like, how is this gonna work? Um, will they be able to survive? Like, what are, where is the best place to put them? Do our fisheries, uh, you know, run the risk of being put out of business by really, really hungry otters? You know, there's, there's a lot of questions around that. And so, um, so we worked with many groups, larger groups, and not just us, uh, throughout the entire, um, uh, the federal government, local, state um, agencies have all come together to talk about how this is going to, how would this work, could this work, and to bring in local involvement from everybody who lives in these areas to see, you know, to get their in fact, input and feedback and, and, and educate people about the potential benefit. 
So um, just circling back again to otters as ecosystem modifiers in this changing climate, having really healthy kelp forests and healthy um, ecosystems just along the coastal area here, as we get more and more impacted by climate change, it's going to behoove us all to have a, a healthy environment. Um, and otters are, are really a significant player in that role. So that's one of the big reasons that we're so interested in, in understanding um, <clears throat> what the disease challenges are, what the environmental challenges are. So I'm li losing my voice a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and how these, um, how these changes might benefit us all uh, if we can re successfully reintroduce them back into their original range throughout the, uh, California, Northern California, Oregon, and up to Washington. Well, thank you so much. It's so exciting to be part of these talks around reintroduction. And I do want to jump into that. But right before I do, we got in a very cute question that I just can't pass up. Um, Adia had asked, um, knowing that sea otters use tools to eat these hard shelled animals in the wild. And so I was curious if we offer our animals in rehab tools in order to eat these hard shelled animals at the center. Oh boy, yeah, that is a great question. And you might have heard me allude to the fact earlier that otters are both mischievous and creative, if not <laughs> crafty. So um, yes, we do give them a little bit of tools. We do have to be a little bit careful because we alluded also to their ability to destroy. So you can see those teeth, they're big and hugely important. So we do wanna supply them with things that they would find in their own environment. Um, but they're also very adept at um, using their concrete pool that they're being housed in as an alternate tool. And so we've actually seen them, you know, pick up a clam, a whole clam from the bottom, swim over to the side of the pool and smash it, um, open it against the, the concrete that, that their pool is lined with. So, um, so they figure it out, um, even if that's not quite natural. Um, so we do want them to be able to use all the tools that they would find and use naturally. Um, we do try to enrich their environments. Um, it can be hard to mimic their exact environment. We don't, we're not able to grow kelp here, but we supplement that with um, things that are hopefully a little bit less human uh, centric. Things like uh, car wash strips make fabulous fake kelp. They're very durable. They can be washed and cleaned. Um, and as you can see in this photo, which is great, the, the otters actually adapt really nicely to sort of wrapping up in them and they feel secure, uh, much more like a natural kelp uh, forest and uh, will often just sleep kind of wrapped in that fake kelp, as we call it. So we are able to provide them with a variety of different enrichment tools. And, and certainly we have a couple of rocks that we've seen some otters grab, but it's kind of interesting to watch them be like, no, nah, I'm just going to use the side of the pool. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for diving into that. I know that that is something extra exciting and wonderful that we're able to see here for our otters that are thriving in rehab efforts. Um, but I do want to now jump back to what you'd mentioned and how important those reintroduction efforts may be, especially with our changing climate. Um, so knowing that reintroduction may serve as a second chance for the species to really live and thrive within that historical range, even including here in San Francisco Bay. Um, but I imagine that that's not uh, a very straightforward process. So Jeff, do you mind talking a little bit more about what that has meant so far? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I can't um, can't resist calling out the video that was just just playing. Hopefully, after I kind of gently poked fun at the way the the otter was bellying along the beach. Look at those guys go right. Look at those hind flippers. The propulsion they get. You know, with, with barely an effort, right? Um, that is their element for sure. Um, yeah, a, a significantly complicated process, not one that is being rushed, but to the contrary, one that is being undertaken and considered with um, a great deal of thought, a great deal of input. Um, and it's worth reminding folks that um, while a feasibility study was done and completed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service last year saying, yeah, this is feasible. We're now into a process of developing a conceptual plan. There is no decision at this point to reintroduce sea otters. It's worth um, reinforcing that point, but it is being explored. And that exploration is going to require a lot of the things that Cara mentioned already um, and a lot of science, right? We, we need to understand 
what the prey availability is in different regions that are being considered. Um, we need to consider all of the stakeholders, the fishing community, the, the local residential and business communities, um, as well as a, a host of other things in even considering different locations. Once that would be done, we need to consider what the source is. Where are these otters gonna come from, right? There are a couple of different ideas. One is, might we translocate some individuals that are in healthy wild populations? Grab some appropriately and carefully move them to a new location, right? Um, animals come into care, come into the care of the Monterey Bay Aquarium in their surrogate program where they have female sea otters that that um, will raise these uh, pups that were otherwise abandoned by their own moms. Might that be a stream of otters that can be reintroduced? We'll treat sea otters here as well at the Marine Mammal Center and um, a releasable otter might be a good candidate for being a part of a, a translocated group. So there's, and it might be some combination of those, not not worked out yet, but what once that would occur, mm -hmm. then you have to have all the monitoring in place to ascertain how these animals are faring. And it may not be a, um, a, a quick ramp up in population. In fact, it's likely not to, to be that. Um, and we have some uh, examples of past translocations that, that will fuel um, our discussions and certainly um, any plan that would come of that. But it's, it's going to be for sure a, a very um, a long process, um, but one I, I know that we think is, is well worth our investment of time and energy and, um, and, and work to see it achieved if possible. Thank you so, so much. I've got one more, I think, for Dr. Kari here. Um, now that we've been talking a little bit about these reintroduction efforts and knowing that it is very much something that's being looked into right now, um, what do you think it would look like if it was successful? Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I, I grew up in Santa Cruz, um, kind of in an area where Otters were still at the time that I was growing up. There, there weren't very many of them, and um, the population grew as did I. And I remember being very excited um, seeing them out there, not really understanding how important they were to the environment, but appreciating their cuteness. And then as I got older, I obviously learned a lot more about that. Um, but as I got older, I, I grew to understand how important they are for an ecosystem health and. Um, I, you know, as somebody who is native to the coast, um, I, I think it's incredibly important that we give this a, a really, really strong and our very best consideration. And the good news is we have incredible people, incredibly smart and talented people working on how this could look, how this could work. This would not be something that happens overnight. This is going to be a multi-decadal, like literally over dozens of years, probably efforts to be able to um, as Jeff said, determine which candidates might be most appropriate. You can't just release one otter at a time. They they live together in groups. Yeah. So we need groups of sea otters to establish like a large colony that might even be able to be a home for potentially dozens, if not hundreds of otters. That's going to take a lot of time. Um, so this is not something that's just going to happen. You're like, oh, we'll just move these five or 10 otters and it'll grow. Um, there's so many challenges. There's all those different diseases. There's uh, climate change. Do the otters swim away? Are they um, not happy where they are? Are they surrogates so they don't know any better? Or as Jeff said, are, were they moved someplace else and they just say, no thanks, I'm out. <laughs> so we've learned so many very important lessons from, from past efforts um, that gives us a lot of um, knowledge about how it can move forward best. Personally, on a personal note, I would love to see otters thriving again in, in parts of our coast that could use their protection and um, their contributions for ecosystem health, because it, it is so important what's down there, what we miss on the surface from seeing the earth surface, we're, we're often just not privileged to see what's below mm. the surface and how healthy that looks. But we feel impact um, around the world, whether we see it or not, not just those of us who live here on the coast, but everybody. Um, you may not know it, but it is there. So however this moves forward, hopefully in a very healthy, balanced um, and measured way, to give it the best shot of success. Um, I, I think it's an incredible opportunity and I'm, I'm flattered and thrilled to be with a group of people that are able to look at all those potential threats and, and beneficial effects uh, to try to make the de best decision about our coastline. Um, so I, I 
you know, uh, the Marine Mammal Center is situated in a place that covers about another four hours or so north of, of here of mm -hmm. San Francisco. So we've got an incredible team already in place monitoring uh, coastal health, you know, being able to see uh, marine mammals that might be struggling and what's happening in our area. So having this network in place, I think already is a big step towards being able to support um, what otter reintroduction could look like and be able to watch these animals and provide feedback real time, um, hopefully when and if that happens. Thank you so much. And I love this photo up here. It looks like all of the otters are celebrating along <laughs> with us as we look to the future and what some of our goals might be and what that looks like. Um, I do want to remind everyone, too, that one great way that you can help out right now is by taking that survey, that We Were Here survey that Heather Barrett talked about at the beginning. And just a little reminder that that's going to be put in the video comments. Um, and it can also be found directly at seaottersavvy.org. But now I am going to transition to taking a little bit more of those questions that we had coming in from the audience, from all of you watching at home. So thank you so much for all of the questions we've already got. Keep them coming. We're going to get to as many as we can here. And I saw some great ones coming in. Um, so Aubrey had asked, is ocean plastic harming sea otters? Yeah, that is, um, of course, always one of our big concerns with all of our marine life. And yes, there have been direct impacts of plastics on sea otters that we've observed. Um, uh, we had a sea otter here that had a fishing line actually entangled around its uh, mid chest. Um, and if you were here, you heard us talk about how important their very dense fur is to keep them warm. Well, unfortunately, this line had been there so long and rubbed so deeply that it caused um, a big gash in the animal's skin um, and had completely. Uh, sort of denuded or debrided all the skin. Um, the skin was open and it had a, a, a wound, its entire width of its body, just all the way around where that line had been rubbing probably for months and months. Um, so unfortunately that wound um, never really fully healed. We're able to remove the monofilament and take care of the otter. And she actually is doing well now, but she uh, was not able to be released back into the wild because she just couldn't keep up calorically with the amount of energy that she's losing through heat loss through that wound. The good news is um, we hope that she will become a surrogate mom sea otter. So at least um, we'll still be able to um, uh, have her contribute to helping sea otters. Um, and we've learned a lot about that. There have been other reports of otters. Um, I know of a colleague that had a, a sea otter in care that had a, just a, um, a loop of, a, it was a, a discarded, um, uh, uh, sorry, a little, uh, uh, the little, the ties, the little zip ties, plastic zip mm. ties. Yeah. Um, and it was still in a loop and it had gotten stuck on the sea otter's paw. They're usually very good at stripping anything that touches them right off. Um, but those plastic bits are, were a little bit too hard and a little too hard. So it, it cut into the, the skin and actually it got so deep, it was actually affecting the bone. Fortunately, in that case, the animal was able to be treated successfully with antibiotics. Um, and the bone healed. The fur didn't grow back quite as quite as well, but it wasn't as big as a window where the cold water would affect that otter. Unfortunately, it was released. So all of those bits of plastic and then um, otters are very clever with their little paws and they're very good at um, distinguishing what they actually eat. But an area that we're very concerned about, all of us is microplastics because microplastics is teeny right. little tiny plastic fragments that all of us kind of just ingest <laughs> on a daily basis are also in the aquatic environment. Um, and those can concentrate just like biotoxins and other things in the food that these animals eat. So right now we don't really understand very well what the effects of microplastics are on us, on otters, or really on the health of any other animals. But that is something that we're concerned about. And we know that toxins and even potentially some parasites and nasty bacteria can stick to those micro, microplastics and can be ingested that way too. So we have a lot of concern, both for big pieces of obviously visible plastic and ocean trash and the very little ones that we can't quite see yet. Um, so hopefully we'll learn more about those effects because unfortunately that ocean plastic uh, is not going anywhere for quite some time. 
And also a good reminder that that's a way that you all at home can help as well. No matter where you are, all rivers, streams, it leads to the ocean. So whether you're very far inland, anything that we use and discard can make its way to the ocean. So choosing reusables when you're able to is going to help out not just the environment, the ocean environment, but also otters as cute as this. So when you're able to, see if you can find those reusable options instead of those single-use plastics. Now we've got another great question in here from Kelly asking, what are some key adaptations that allow sea otters to thrive in their marine environment? Happy to jump in on, on that one. Um, boy, looking at that, uh, that photo and the two animals there and that dense coat of fur, I've got to call out that one as, as adaptation number one. <laughs> that is essential for these guys. They don't have, um, and, and Cara mentioned this relative to um, shark attacks, right? Um, they don't have a thick uh, layer of blubber. Uh, instead, they rely on that fur coat, right? A million hairs per square inch. Still want to track down the person who had to count that in that study, but that's what we say, a million hairs per square inch. Just think about that, right? And 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 look at it. What that does is it creates a, 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 a basically a barrier between their skin and the cold water. They will actually um, blow air into the fur and create something of a little um, uh, cushion around them um, and a barrier to that cold water. Um, Pacific Ocean is quite cold. And some of the problems that these animals uh, face are specifically when that gets breached. So Carr mentioned the fishing line that was um, denuding an area. Just a small patch of uncovered skin can lead to a lot of heat loss. But back to those adaptations, look at those little midi forepaws, right? Um, strong as the dickens and um, really dexterous, able to get, you know, classically like an abalone that we would have to dive down with a, a, you know, a tool to bring off of a rock. They're able to get those animals bashing rocks into crabs and things. Um, tool users in an amazing way with those forepaws. We talked about the hind flippers and, and how those propel them. Their um, deep chest and their ability to, um, to dive to good depth um, for good duration is another adaptation that serves them well. Um, I saw a question about um, storms and, and how those take toll on, on animals. Certainly animals can be separated, a, a mother from a, an infant perhaps, but these, these are crafty, um, crafty animals. They are coastal animals, right? So they're, they're never far from shoreline. And they'll come into quieter waters uh, during storms, or they'll literally wrap themselves up in in kelp, which is anchored to the to the seafloor. So, um, uh, yeah, the the adaptations list just goes on and on. Thank you so so much for that. I've got um, a kind of I think adorable question here. <laughs> um, I've got a question in asking about if we name the sea otters before release or if they get numbers. Actually, they get both. Um, so all of our patients here at the Marine Mammal Center get uh, what we call a field identification number. Um, and that's a, a permanently signed number um, that is basically the number of the animal of that species that we've had. So if this sea otter was the uh, 780th sea otter that we've had, we would call it SO-780. So sea otter 780 or some something along those lines. Um, and they also get a name because um, we often have many dozens, if not hundreds of animals on site at a time and always trying to remember everybody's number is a little bit more challenging. So we, we do give them a name and that helps us keep track of them. Um, it also helps to be perfect lioness, helps us all refer to them in a way that um, everybody sort of gets to know them a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot easier to remember usually than number, a number. So uh, so we have our own internal numbering system. And then we also work with fish and wildlife um, to make sure that they get an appropriate fish and wildlife number as well. Uh, and then their last identification is that flipper tag. And you can see right there that says 219. Um, that is also semi-permanent because we've known otters, again, clever little guys, to chew those tags out. Um, and ditch them. Um, so the tags are really helpful for having a visual recite of otters um, once they're released or in, in, uh, as part of a health study and being able to watch them and track them and see how they're doing. And if we see an otter who doesn't look good and it has a tag, then we know that 
we know who that animal is and we actually get a history, um, which is something that's us veterinarians always want. Like, what's the, what's the patient's history? Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Um, and then of course, to be able to, you know, track how they're doing over the years. So, so all those identifiers are really important helping us get as much information on individual animals as we can and to tell our partner agencies about them, what they look like, what their flipper tag number may be, and to share information if they end up stranding again elsewhere where one of our partners is um, taking care of them. Thank you so much for that. I know that there's a lot of very wonderful ones. We saw Paddle One earlier, in addition to some of these other wonderful otters that we've had in our care. Now I have one last question that we'll have time for today, and it's a little bit of a doozy here. Um, so we had a question come in from Joseph asking if we're collecting DNA that may provide some clues for health and family genetics. Actually, yes. Uh, one of the important ways that we understand genetic diversity and inbreeding stressors, um, which means that if we have a small population and they're breeding closely together, we can get abnormalities or inbreeding effects. Um, and so by understanding the genetics of the population, especially for sea otters, because you have pups born in the same area where then staying in the same area where, growing up, where they were born. And so you have similar otters related to each other. So we do want to understand how they're related and whether or not they might be subjected to genetic uh, problems that might prohibit or inhibit um, their success as a wild species, especially because they had such a powerful genetic bottleneck when their population was so reduced. So whenever we have an otter, um, if it dies or is found dead, a sample of skin is collected and saved so that that can be analyzed for their genetic relatedness. And um, for the animals that strand and are rehabilitated, when we put in their flipper tags, um, the, it's a little bit like a hole punch. I know it sounds terrible, but they're nest ties, though. They don't feel it when we put in those flipper tags. A tiny little piece of skin uh, becomes available to us through like a little hole punch to be perfectly honest. So that's a little skin sample that we save so that we can use that later um, to look at their genetic relatedness. Well, thank you so, so much for letting us pick your brains this entire time. I know I could talk for another two or three hours about these little fierce fun marine mammals that we've got but we are at, right out about time so i want to just take a moment here to thank you dr cara field thank you dr jeff boehm and for all of your expertise that you've shared with us today and in addition to that thank you to heather barrett and to sea otter savvy for putting together such a fabulous lineup for the week to celebrate sea otter awareness week don't forget to fill out that survey um, so that your voice can be heard on sea otter introduction from wherever you are tuning in from here today. Um, and hopefully we see you for the next uh, Sea Otter Awareness Week event that's happening later this evening, 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. We'll go ahead and put the link to that schedule in the chat as well. Um, so you've got the survey link, you've got the link to the events. I hope you all have an otterly possum rest of possum rest of your week <laughs> and get to celebrate sea otters all week long. Thank you all so, so much for tuning in.